друзья, всем привет. Мы рады вас приветствовать на одном из научно-технических семинаров Яндекса, которые мы проводим по нескольку штук в год, часто больше десятка, иногда даже больше дюжины. Сегодня у нас в гостях Петр Рихтарик, профессор университета Эдинбурга. So here we go, Peter. We are glad to, to see you here. You can start talking. Thank you so much for coming. Right, so thank you very much for the very nice introduction, of which I did not say anything. But I'm sure you said some amazing stuff about me. None of that is true. Uh, anyway, so uh, as you can see, my slides are too small for the big data company of Yandex and not good enough. So I apologize to those in the region. Those are the guys who came late, right? The guys who came sooner over there. So I'll be speaking about empirical risk minimization. Before I start the talk, I, I want to just get a little bit of a feel for how many people here know what empirical risk minimization is. Almost everybody, great, okay. Complexity, duality, the other things, anything out there. Okay, so then I'll just go. <laughs> All right, so, uh, <coughs> so I have very short time here to talk about a very broad topic. Empirical risk minimization is something which uh, has been developing incredibly fast over the last several years, and there is an enormous amount of research in that area. So I am not attempting here to, to review that area at all. I'll, I'm simply going to follow a couple of papers of which I've been a co-author, uh, which I think uh, shed light on what's going on in empirical risk minimization. A and in particular, these papers shed light on what uh, complexity you might uh, want to uh, get out of these, what is achievable, then on uh, the role of duality and uh, sampling, sparsity, big data, and so on. So I'm only highlighting certain things here. And feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. I, I really like to uh, listen to some questions and so on. So uh, this is John work uh, with uh, several co-authors. Martin Takac, who is now assistant professor at Lehigh University in the US, a PhD student of mine at the time. Uh, Chu Zhang. Uh, former postdoc of mine, now assistant professor in Hong Kong, and Tong Zhang, head of the, head of the uh, big data lab at Baidu. So mostly I'll talk about quartz, this algorithm, but before I get there, I'll talk about this other thing. There's an algorithm which we call, can you read what this means? There's a little logo which we came up with. So this is what we do in academia when we have spare time, where we procrastinate, we just come up with some nice logos. It's M-Sync, yeah, it's the boy band, okay, these guys dancing around. So that's N hidden in between those two arrows, uh, the, the stars there, okay? And uh, uh, don't ask me why we came up with this, uh, with this uh, logo. In fact, uh, I asked a colleague of mine uh, when I was thinking about what name we should uh, give to this algorithm, and he agreed to do whatever you want, so, so he's to blame. Okay, so the outline of the talk is that I'll first uh, introduce optimization in a very, very sim simple setting, very simplified setting. In fact, I'll talk about unconstrained minimization of strongly convex functions and smooth functions. So it's, it's the sim simplest possible apart from quadratic uh, case uh, you, you can think of. But then I'll talk about something else which is quite complicated, which is arbitrary sampling. So there'll be very simple optimization problem, but the randomness will be uh, introduced in a very general setting. And that way we'll get a feel for how optimization interfaces uh, randomness. And then I'll describe the complexity of this algorithm. There'll be several lessons to be learned ju just from understanding the simple setting. And then we'll get away from this toy example, already having learned something about uh, that interplay, and we'll jump into empirical risk minimization. And then a similar story will unroll, but it will just get a little bit more complicated. It will be easy to easier to follow that uh, once uh, we go through the first part. And then uh, I'll talk about some special cases and some extensions at the end. Right, so optimization and randomness. So let's consider the following problem. You want to minimize a function. Okay, this is fx, so x is the variable you want to find. And uh, there's no constraints whatsoever. So just say x is an n-dimensional vector, and you want to minimize this function. So why on earth would I think of minimizing something like this? It seems to be very, very simple. In fact, the function is convex. It's more than that, it's strongly convex. 
Uh, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. So it's, it's a nice function, which looks like quadratic, something like that. If you know, everything is fine. Uh, so, so this is a very simple function, but now there is something complicated about this function. It's, it's not a shape. It is the fact that n is really, really huge. So what do you do if the dimension of the space is really, really huge? And by this, I mean huge means different thing, things to different people. If you have a laptop, huge may, maybe a million. If you have something larger, maybe a billion or trillion if you have a supercomputer. So, so huge depends on the architecture that you have. So, so just supply n with whatever you consider to be huge. Right, and now I'll describe a very, very simple algorithm. And now I'll, I'll go slowly through this, and I want everybody to understand what's going on. And there's the NSYNC algorithm, the funny name. So if you don't remember anything else, just remember there's the algorithm with the funny name. Okay, presented by the funny guy. All right, so here is the algorithm. Since n is huge, the number of variables is very huge, we do not want to touch all of those variables in every iteration. We'll have an iterative process, iterative algorithm, and the algorithm is only going to update a subset of the variables in each iteration. And you design how the sub subset is going to be selected. Uh, it's going to be a random subset, okay? But apart from that, it can be any randomness uh, you may wish to throw in there. So by this I mean there's exponentially many subsets of the set of coordinates, right? There's n of them, 2 to the power of n subsets. And all of these can be chosen with probabilities that you choose if you wish. I'm not saying that is the way to do it, but in, 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 in theory, this is, this is what you can do. So for instance, you can just always choose set st to be singleton, always just one coordinate that you will update. Or it can be a pair of coordinates, or, or all of them, with probably one, okay? It can be anything that you wish. It can be variable number of coordinates. And those that you selected, which belong to that set, you're going to take something like a gradient step for those coordinates. So this is the gradient of the function. So it's a vector, this huge dimensional vector. So if n is a billion, let's say, this is a billion dimensional vector. And ei is a vector of all zeros, just one in ith place. So it just picks one partial derivative in this, in this vector. So when you take this uh, in, a, in a product here, you just get a vector which is completely sparse, which is ith partial derivative of f at place i. And now you subtract a multiple, where the multiple is 1 over vi, from xit. Okay? So if you know what these vi's are, then you can run this algorithm. Okay? Once you know that, you can run this algorithm. And for the uh, coordinates that you didn't select, which are not in this random set, you don't do anything. You don't touch them. So uh, this is what you do. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to do this if you had to compute the whole gradient, right? That, that would seem very stupid. You compute the whole gradient, and then you multiply it by this ei vector, and you zero everything out. So the idea is that you don't, don't do that. You only compute the partial derivatives belonging to that set st. And that can be much cheaper than computing all of them, okay? In fact, behind this will be some data set which defines the function f, and you can think of the data set as being composed of n elements. This could be n images, n videos, or something like this. And by doing this, you are looking only at a subset, at a mini-batch of those examples, of those images, of those videos. Something like this will be behind. It's hidden uh, here uh, fr from, from the view at the moment. Okay, so I want to pause for a minute and, and, and give the audience uh, uh, chance to, to ask some clarifying questions before, before I move on. If you don't mind, I have one question. I don't mind. Uh, the question of the, the subset sample size. Sure. Uh, is there any, well, is there any rule of thumb to choose the size of the subset? So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to describe the, this algorithm in this full generality and I will describe how well it does in the full generality, and then depending on the application that you have and the computer that you have, the answer di is, is different. So there's no rule of thumb which applies in generality. If you have a single a core, let's say, then you would tend to choose smaller mini-batches, so st would be smaller. If, if you have a distributed system, then these sts would be structured and larger, and so on. Uh, 
So that is one thing that matters. Another thing is with what probabilities do you pick which of these coordinates? And that's another question. Uh, and the answer is not immediate. Yeah. So at this moment, we don't see that. But once you come up with the, with the analysis, it will give you insight. It will give us insight into what's going on. And then we might think about what function do we have and how should we choose this parameter. Okay, but another insight is the following. If st is everything with probability 1, then this is uh, an algorithm that everybody knows probably in this room. Right? This is gradient descent. Right? So I'm taking a uh, negative gradient step. I'm just scale these partial derivatives with different vi's. If these vi's were the same, then this would be the step size that I'm, that I'm applying times the gradient. Right? So you can think of this as being some sort of a randomized version of, 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 of gradient descent. Okay. But that is usually going to be the, the, the bad uh, choice. You wouldn't want to do that. Okay. Any more questions? I'm going to insist on one or two more. I want to get to know you. Okay. So lambda strongly convex. So it's something like this. Convex function is such function which at every point you can lower bound it with a line which touches the function from below. And lambda strongly convex is at every point you can lower bound it by a quadratic which is which has a modulus of curvature, which is at least lambda. So it's something stronger than convexity. Okay, I don't have a board to draw this, but every point you lower bound it by something quadratic, which has certain curvature. So if lambda is small, it's almost like, like a line. If lambda grows, then uh, the function is, is more curvy. And somehow, if lambda is large, the, the function is easier uh, to minimize. So there's something uh, known in convex analysis and convex optimization. Okay? So lambda small sucks, lambda large is good. Okay? All right. One more question, then I go. Not home, just you know, further with the slides. <laughs> I know at this point maybe you would want me to go home, but... Uh, Could you please give some examples except for big optimization? where this problem is huge and actually arise machine learning? <sighs> so this is not necessarily uh, a talk about machine learning. That's the first answer. So you could have problems such as Lasso problem. Some may think there's actually ERM, a special case of ERM, but not necessarily. Uh, so Lasso problem would be uh, a rich would be, be something like rich regression, except the rich, uh, para rich uh, penalization is replaced with L1. So it's uh, L1 regularized least squares problem. And if you have huge number of parameters and you want to do a variable selection, L1 thing will help you choose that. That's, that's one example. But then you might say it's, it's ERM, it's right? Strange, it's strange thing that when you yeah. have a number of features, which are just billions of so, them. So, so, the, the so, the, so the problem with ERM is that one way of defining ERM is that it's, and I didn't go there yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll do that now. So it's, it's, it's a problem where you minimize uh, a sum of functions. Well, one special case of that is minimizing sum of one function, and that is the general case. So in some sense, you're asking me, give me an optimization problem, which is not an optimization problem, right? I mean, everything in some sense can be caused as ERM if you really wish. So I will not give you an example. <laughs> All right, so we're good to go. So am I going? Right, I talked about that. So here's complexity. So how does this algorithm do? So uh, you have this very crazy thing here. And I want to take a very quick poll. How many of you want me to actually explain what this means? How many of you want me to just pass through this? Who wants me to? Explain. You. OK. All right. So. So on, at one level, you can just ignore everything, all of this, if, if this looks complicated. And the, 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 the only message you, sh you should take uh, away is that this is a definition of VIs. Okay? So here are VIs, these step sizes, which I didn't tell you what they were. And they have to be chosen in a smart way. In fact, if you're not smart, these VIs can be chosen in such a way that this thing will diverge. 
Okay, there's this, they can be just, you know, too bad, uh, too small. Right, if they're too small, this thing might diverge. If they're large enough, then, then everything's fine. But how to choose them? This is the definition of the VIs. So, so here you have an inequality where on the left-hand side you have something which doesn't involve the VIs, right? And on the right-hand side you have something which involves the VIs. So if this inequality halts, then uh, that is the definition of the VIs. And this inequality has to hold for every X and every H. Okay? And you can, you can notice that the right-hand side grows with VIs. If VIs are larger, the right-hand side goes up because these PIs are positive numbers, HI squared are positive numbers. So if VIs grow, the right-hand side grows. So if the inequality holds for some VIs, if you grow them, it will still hold. Okay, so that is not interesting. So what you really want, you want the VIs to be as small as possible for the inequality to still hold. All right? Why does that intuitively make sense? Because if you have VIs which are small, that means that 1 over VI is large, which means that you have, uh, if you're a machine learner, you, ha you have a large uh, learning rate. Okay, you learn fast. Uh, if you're an optimizer, you, you you're taking large step sizes. Okay, you go in, in some direction and you, and you are able to do that as opposed to just doing that. Okay? So you want to be able to take large step sizes, step sizes, but not so large that you just you know, go away from where you should be going. Okay, so that is, that is the quick explanation. The little bit uh, intermediate explanation is that what you would want the algorithm to do is to minimize the left-hand side in some sense, in each step. So think of it that way. You have a function that you want to minimize, that's the f, and x is where you're standing right now, okay? And you want to move somewhere, right? And uh, what is this thing, sum of h i's, e i's? Well, that is just vector h, which is zero out everywhere outside of the set uh, s hat, which is the st thing on the previous slide, okay? Sorry for that. So I sometimes use s hat if I don't, if I don't want to stress that, you know, um, that it happens at iteration t. So this is just vector <coughs> h <coughs> with all h is zero out outside of the set to which you selected, which means that it's just one step of this algorithm. A x plus this thing is the next point where you move. So why would you move from x to x plus h? Well, you would move because x plus h is a better point, which means function value is smaller, right? But h is random because this s is random. So what do you do? You take the expectation of this function value at the next iterate, which is going to be random, and you want it to be as small as possible. OK? Right. So uh, fine. But that is a very difficult task. How do you decide on h so that this expectation of f x plus h, subscript s hat, is as small as possible? That is a very, very difficult task. right? So you cannot do that. In general, this is not something that you can just, doesn't have closed form uh, solution, if, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's many issues with it. But if you can come up with an upper bound like this for the expectation, this upper bound just solves that issue. Because this upper bound is quadratic only, even if f was widely nonlinear, this is just quadratic. It's separable in those coordinates. It's just sum of univariate functions in these, uh, in these i's, right? So in fact, you can minimize it very easily in H. Okay? And that is exactly how you choose this H. And that defines the algorithm. Okay? In fact, if you choose some subset S, you only have to minimize only the subset of I's belonging to, to that set S. Right? So you have closed form expression exactly where you should go for each I. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, just think of this as definition of these VIs. That's all. And uh, we, in fact, we're so intrigued by this inequality, we wrote a paper just about this, just about the inequality and giving recipes how for different functions f and different sets s, you can compute easily. We just give expressions for these vi's so that you don't have to worry about them at all. Okay. Right. And uh, so, by the way, this pi is probability that i th coordinate is selected in this random set. So you'll see this throughout. Fine. So do you have any questions about this, anybody? I hope not. Oh, you do. Okay. What can? Okay. So, <coughs> so there is something second order going on here, and in fact, vi contains very light touch of a second order information about function f, 
In fact, there's something like the diagonal of the Hessian uh, depend, the VI is influenced by the diagonal of the Hessian. You can think of it that way. Okay. I can tell you much more about this later on. Good. And here's the complexity result. Okay, it's very, very simple. So usually when you see complexity results, there's all kinds of O's everywhere, and omegas, and tildes, and so on. None of that is here. So this is very, very simple. And the complexity result is saying, if the number of iterations of this thing is at least something, which I will unpack in a moment, then with very high probability, you have an approxim approximate solution. Okay? So first of all, notice that we cannot any longer just say fxc minus fx star is less than or equal to epsilon, which is what normally in optimiz optimization you would want to do. You want to say that you are epsilon close from the optimum. Right? And why can you not say that? Because uh, this is a randomized algorithm. So it will produce a sequence of random variables. So you may be just unlucky. With very small probability, you can be just picking the same coordinate over and over over again right? for trillion iterations. That can happen with non-zero probability. Right? It's vanishingly small, but it's not zero. And that means that if you are so unlucky, then you don't get anywhere, and you're stuck. So that can happen. That's why you have to have something like at least with probably one minus row, and you can control this row. So you pick this row to be arbitrarily small, but not zero. And you pick your epsilon, and then notice that the row and epsilon appear inside this logarithm here. And as everybody knows, logarithm of anything is a constant, right? So, unless that anything is doubly exponential or something. OK, so this is nothing. Let, let's, let's believe there's nothing. So the logarithm is, is, is not there. And, and that is, in fact, in practice, that is exactly the case. So in practice, this doesn't matter at all. What matters is this thing in front. So we should just focus on that. All right? So what is that? It's the maximum of these vi's divided by pi's times lambda. Right? So that's it. It's as simple as that. So in fact, if lambda is very, very, very large, right, then this is going to be very, very, very fast. Right? So good strong convexity, the, the, the strong, stronger convexity you have, the, much, the more convexity you have, the better. OK. Uh, that's, that's one good thing. And then you have these strange VIs, which at the moment are just defined through this crazy inequality, which we have no clue what they are, right? divided by these PIs, which we kind of know what they are, because we, we designed them. So in fact, if you, if you choose everything with probably 1, then PIs will be 1. right? If you have the deterministic algorithm, which selects everything with probably 1, which is the gradient descent method, then PIs are just 1s. And this is simply just max of VIs divided by lambda. In fact, in that case, you can choose these VIs to be the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of function f for the experts in the audience. And this is then uh, L divided by lambda. So VI is just L divided by lambda. This is the condition number of the function. And that is exactly recovering the standard result for gradient descent. Okay? So there's no surprise there. But if uh, you choose, let's say, just one coordinate at a time, so PI is 1 over n. If you choose one coordinate at a time with uniform probabilities, then PI is going to be 1 over n. So that n is, go is going to jump to vi, right? So you have n times vi. So, so this is going to make uh, our life harder. But of course, each iteration is much cheaper. So, so uh, what will actually happen is that the algorithm will be much faster in practice than the deterministic one. So that's what's going on. And again, I want to puzzle uh, a little and take one, two, three questions. So n is huge, and whatever you consider, to, whatever you consider to be huge, that that's what I mean, exactly. That's a good question. So so n is hidden in the vi's and in the pi's. Okay. So if if you choose uniform probabilities, then pi's is one over n. So n is right there. Vi's do not have to necessarily depend. In fact, then they will not depend on on, on dimension. So dimension will just pop up there, it's, and, and the, the complexity will be proportional to the dimension. So it will be something like max vi times the dimension. And if the max vi is small, well, this will tell you that you need few passes through the, all the coordinates to solve this to machine precision. Okay, Something like that. This is a very brief answer. But that is not necessarily the best choice. Then you can play with the probabilities and see what happens. OK, so one more, and then I go to the next slide. And I have to do this because I don't have any slides, OK? I'm really forced. And they promised me uh, 
like a thousand, you know, dollars for every question. So. Well, we can uh, we can pick uh, PI arbitrarily because we can uh, to make it zero. Right. So so these PIs can be anything, but not zero. Right. And that makes sense because if you choose such sampling, such random set that PI for some i is going to be zero, that means that you never updated coordinate. And if you're not already optimal, you will never be. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, does uh, this formula represent a uh, number of iterations? Yes. Yeah. And uh, then what is um, the complexity of each iteration? Yes. So, so I don't have a slide on that. The, the complexity of each iteration, usually, this is not always the case, but for many functions of interest, complexity of each iteration will be proportional to the size of that uh, set that you pick. Okay, that is the rule of thumb. Sometimes it can be better than that. If you have sparsity in the data, so let's say if the function is actually quadratic, then the complexity would be something like the average number of non-zeros uh, in the data selected by the set, okay, whatever the data means, because I didn't define properly what I mean by data there. But this is what it would be if there was some data around. So if, you, if the size is bigger, complexity of each iteration is going to be bigger, and if the size is small, it's going to be small. Okay. All right, so, so here, is, here, here are two examples. And, and with this slide, uh, you'll see what, what is the difference between taking these probabilities uniformly and non-uniformly. Okay, so, so very quickly we understand what important sampling or optimal sampling in this setup is. And, and this, is, this is a very short lesson in this, in this example, but you can see this throughout optimization of machine learning. Whenever you have some randomized algorithms, uniform randomization is going to give you something, and usually it's not going to be optimal, and some non-uniform will be better, and, and you have to know why, and in this context this is why. You'll exactly know why. And, and something like this is always true in, in all of these other contexts. So if these probabilities are the same, so you choose all the coins uniform, uniformly, so pi is 1 over n, then I, I'm just going to plug them here into this formula of the leading factor, and I get n times max the vs divided by lambda. Right? And since this is a very smart crowd, you can already figure out that if I choose pi's to be proportional to the vi's, which I can, you just have to sum up to 1, then I plug it in there, and I get some of the vi's divided by lambda. And some of the vi's is much better, in general, than n times the maximum. Right? And oftentimes, these vi's tell you something about the data. So, so this is some, somehow some property of the data which is behind, which again, I didn't describe. But these vi's can be widely non-uniform. If they are, then uh, these non-uniform probabilities will go a long way in, in, in helping your algorithm. If the data is in some sense the same, then, uh, then it doesn't matter, whatever you do. Okay? So uniform probabilities will be, will be fine. So notice that this can be better than this even by many orders of magnitude. So this can be much better. Uh, but it can be also the same. Okay? All right, so, so some extensions. Uh, so this was ve very, very simplified setup. And uh, the, the simplified setup uh, allow me to explain a few things in a very easy way. Now, you can go further than this in, in many different ways. One way is this alpha algorithm. It was another, another kind of trip we had with coming up with the name of an algorithm. Uh, I don't know why. So alpha is like the first letter, like the best, I guess, or <laughs> something like that. Right. So, so what, do we, what you can do, you can generalize this algorithm further so that it will have even better complexity than this. You can accelerate it in, 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 in the nester of sense. And then the complexity, instead of uh, the condition number, you'll have square root of the condition number. Okay? You get something like this. Uh, so th something like this we do here and, and, and this paper here. And the second paper is where we just compute formulas for these VIs, for these step sizes, for all kinds of functions and samplings. That's what we do there. Right, so empirical risk minimization. Uh, let me just very, f very quickly introduce uh, what I mean by this, even though Everybody knows, but I'll introduce my notation here. So I'm going to think that I have these data label pairs. I'm in the domain of, of uh, supervised learning. So I have some data, and the data is modeled by some matrices. 
So, uh, and the labels are some vectors. They don't have to be necessarily scalars, some vectors. And, and they appear in the world with some distribution. Okay, so there's some, let's say, uh, images on Flickr or something like this. There's lots of them. I, I, I don't know them all. You do, but uh, I don't know them all. And I'm, ju I'm just going to think that I can, when I download a random image, then, uh, then I'm accessing a random sample from the distribution. I'm just going to believe that that's what's going on. So when I do that, what I would like to do, I'd like to come up with a predictor, which I'll call W. And in this case, it's going to be a linear predictor. It doesn't have to be. Uh, but in, in this talk, I'll talk about linear predictors which when I multiply with this uh, data, then I get approximately the label in some sense. Right? So now this approximately is, uh, is, is very vague. So first of all, it's vague because so what does it mean? Am I computing some distance between AI transpose W and, and Y or something like this? So there'd be some loss function there associated with this pair. And then there is another way in which this is vague, and that is uh, that I'm drawing a random pair of, of uh, data and label. So this has to have some probabilistic meaning. Okay? So what, in fact, I'll do, I choose this loss function, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw a random pair of this data and the label. I apply my algorithm. My algorithm is stored in this vector w. Okay? So that's my predictor. And I say that I want the expected loss to be as small as possible. Okay? So again, I draw a random pair, I take the expectation, and I want to minimize this. And now, I would like to compute W, which is my algorithm, predictor, which minimizes the expected loss. And now you can see there's all kinds of issues here with this. So first of all, I don't even know what the distribution is. So how can I minimize a function, which is an expectation, over a distribution that I don't know? Okay? So that, is, that is, you know, seems like a difficult issue, but you know, big data can solve anything, so you do Monte Carlo integration. Right? So you just start downloading these images, which means you start sampling from the distribution, and you re replace the integral by uh, finite average, and that's it. And if you have enough data, at some rate, statistical learning theory will tell you, or, or numerical integration will tell you, that the expectation will be well approximated uh, by this uh, finite average. And this, is, this principle is called empirical risk minimization. So you replace the expectation by empirical risk, which is just uh, uh, numerical integration. Okay? So that's what's going on. So you just draw this data set, and this is where this talk touches big data. So you need this n to be big, because this numerical integration is, is, very, is very silly, right? And, and that means that n really has to be very large. Okay? Right, and then I'm going to minimize this average of a huge number of functions. Now, I'll assume that this w, this algorithm, this predictor, is going to live in Rd, and I'm not assuming that this d is particularly large. It could be large. In fact, it could be larger than n. But in this talk, I'll talk about the case where d is uh, much smaller than n. If, if, if this flips around, then, then you would have to do something else. In fact, you can do the same thing, but in reverse, what I'm going to talk about. Right, so another uh, moment for increasing my account. If the some experiments on the your algorithm, algorithm with uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent in mixture. Okay. So what was the question? You mentioned uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, if there are <coughs> some experiments uh, uh, in mixture with your algorithm and stochastic gradient Okay, so, so I didn't do any experiments yet, but I'll, I'll touch on this topic. So, in fact, you're asking something about comparison of stochastic gradient descent with this. No. You ask whether I did any experiments with stochastic gradient descent compared to coordinates and the data set. So, combining, or you ask about combination. Okay, you ask about combination. So, in fact, we wrote a paper on that, but I'm not talking about it in this. We call this. S2CD, semi-stochastic coordinate descent, where we combine something like variance-reduced stochastic gradient descent, because stochastic gradient descent alone doesn't have this variance reduction property, which makes it extremely slow. So that's why we use variance-reduced stochastic gradient descent and combine it with coordinate descent. And then uh, one can also prove things and, and so on. But I'm not really going to touch on that. OK, that's now understood the question. All right. Okay, so that is, that is the problem. So now let's formalize it. 
So the formal problem will look like this. Uh, so this is it. These are the loss functions. This is the finite average. And, and I'm going to assume something about these loss functions because I want to, I want to say something very concrete here. So I want to, I want to really focus my attention on, on something. So here these functions will be 1 over gamma smooth. So by this I mean that if I, if I vary these gradients, I, I compute a gradient of the loss function at t and at t prime, then it's not going to grow too much. It's going to grow at most by multiple 1 over gamma times the difference between t and t prime. Okay, so this is called 1 over gamma smoothness. And if you're asking why 1 over gamma smoothness and not gamma smoothness, then I'll tell you, well, because something else will be gamma strongly convex then. Okay? And if I call this gamma smoothness, then that something else will be 1 over gamma strongly convex, and you will ask me why is 1 over gamma strongly convex, right? So there is no way to escape this. Okay, so this is this. And then I'm going to depart from the previous, uh, previous uh, uh, slide, and I'm going to introduce a regularizer. And I guess everybody knows why we regularize, so I'm going to throw then uh, a regularizer. And if you don't know why we regularize, don't worry. So I'll just add this function there, and that's it. Okay, I will not explain that. I cannot explain everything. It's a very short talk. So, and I'm going to assume this regularizer is strongly convex. In fact, it's one strongly convex. That will mean that this inequality is true. So this is, in fact, the definition of the strong convexity somebody asked about before. This inequality has to hold for every w and w prime. So you get this lower bound, which is quadratic. So this regularizer times this regularization parameter is going to be lambda strongly convex, just an, as in the previous example. So in fact, this function is going to be lambda strongly convex, just, just as before. But g doesn't have to be, just doesn't have to be smooth. Can be no smooth. All right, and now how do we apply the previous algorithm, NSYNC, to this? So any ideas? Right. So I just cooked, it, cooked this up as an impossible question, because uh, no, no, p means primal problem. That's what p means. This is not the probability. So in fact, I, I was lying to you the whole time, right? Because I told you that I have a cool algorithm for minimizing functions, which are nice. And this is not nice, okay? And which depend on a huge number of parameters, and it doesn't, because d is smaller than n, right? So, so I just, I, I was just, you know, I just made a mistake, and then I have to ashamed go home, right? This is just the wrong introduction to this thing. Well, in fact, there is a risk here. So if n is huge in the sum here and d is small, if you look at something that is called a dual problem, then in fact these things will flip around in some sense. Then the dual function will depend on n variables. It will be n-dimensional. It will live in n-dimensional space. Where n is a trillion, it will depend on tri trillion dimensions. So that's why there's duality in this talk as well. I'll look at the dual problem, and then it will have the property that I want. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. And what does duality mean? If you don't know, don't worry. I'll just explain it to you here on one slide, okay? It's so easy. So this is, well, this is not duality. This is a dual function. It looks horrible, okay? But I'll tell you what it, what it means. So, right. So if g is 1 strongly convex, then g star is going to be 1 smooth and convex. Okay, that is, that is something strange. Let's, let's say that g is just L2 squared, just the standard regularizer, okay? L2 norm squared. Then g star is also L2 norm squared. So this thing is just a quadratic function. It's just a very complicated way of writing down a quadratic function. Concave quadratic, which is minus, right? With, without the minus, we convex. With the minus, is concave quadratic. Something very, very simple. In fact, uh, it's as simple as, 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 the, as, as the thing I was talking about in the beginning with the NSYNC. And this thing is, is complicated because these phi stars functions, they are not necessarily smooth, but they are strongly convex, which is a good thing. Okay? You, you kind of now believe that strong convexity is a good thing. So there are non-smooth, which is bad, strongly convex, which is good, and separable, because this is sum of, uh, of uh, variables which don't depend on each other. Okay, these alpha i's, these dual variables, just are separable. Okay? So, uh, so this thing is good altogether. And now you can see that this dual vector lives in this n-dimensional space, this huge dimensional space. If you think of m as being 1, so this lowercase m, which means that you only have one label. You don't have a vector of labels, just a single label, such as in 
uh, in, in uh, logistic regression, okay, just a binary uh, classification, then uh, m will be 1, and the dual variable is just n-dimensional, where n was the number of examples that you had. Okay? So now we're in that realm, and we think of this d as being this function minus f, which we had before. And we want to apply something like n-sync to this. Does that make sense? So the only thing you should remember about this is that this is a concave maximization problem, which is the same thing as convex minimization problem. It is strongly convex. In fact, this lambda is strongly convex, as before. So it almost fits that framework, but it's not smooth. And that's why it doesn't really fit this. It's just very short of fitting that framework of n-sync, because it's non-smooth. But other than that, everything is fine. The dimensionality of the dual vector is huge, so we should do something like the n-sync. Okay? So, why is this dual thing? How many of you don't know why this dual thing has anything to do with the primal? That you've seen this for the first time? This is not possible. Come on, be honest. Really? Okay. Okay. Why am I giving this talk? All right. So here is Fenster duality established on just one slide. So you take the primal function value, subtract the dual from it, the way I defined this, and this is it. Okay. So if you just believe me that you just subtract those two complicated things, this is what you get. I didn't do anything. I just put it down there. That's all I did. But now, I define this alpha bar being this strange thing here. So that's alpha bar is a, is a new concept there. And notice what happens here. This stuff is non-negative, and this stuff is non-negative. Why is that non-negative? It's non-negative because of the definition of these fanchal dual functions, g stars. If you look at the previous slide, how this dual, Fenchel dual, was defined, it's precisely defined in such a way that this thing is non-negative. Okay? And these phi i stars are precisely defined in such a way that all of these n uh, sums here are non-negative. So this difference is always non-negative. So if you have a problem where you want to minimize function p, that's the primal problem, and the dual when you want to maximize function d, then somehow these things can never cross, because p is always larger than d, always. And that is called weak duality. If you have something like that, you have some sort of duality, and it's called weak duality. And if these things can actually match, they don't have to match, right? They can just, the minimum here can be here, and the maximum can be there, and there's some gap, which is called duality gap. But in this case, there won't be any duality gap. These things will match, which means that by solving the dual problem, which is maximization problem, you have solved the primal one, which is minimization because the values match, okay? So that's the idea. So we solve the dual problem instead, but using that, we actually have solved the primal, right? So that's what we're going to do. And in fact, I don't have to prove the weak duality here, which I wouldn't attempt to do, uh, or strong duality, I mean. But in fact, the algorithm is an algorithmic proof of the strong duality. That's not the reason why we have the algorithm. We have the algorithm because we believe it runs fast and so on. But as a byproduct, it actually, the fact that it converges proves that there is no gap. Okay? Otherwise, it wouldn't converge. Because it will say something about the duality gap shrinking to zero. That's what the complexity result will be. Right. And now, I want you to help me design the algorithm. Okay? And I'll start, I'll start you up. So we'll start in this way. Uh, if you look at these things, and if, if, you, if you understand your functional duality, then you know that this, this thing, which is not zero, will be zero precisely when this equality is true. Okay, that follows from that little convex analysis of functional duality there. Okay? You don't have to know uh, why, but it is, it is the case. So if W is the gradient of this G star at alpha bar, then you're good, and this is zero. And that's what we want. We want this thing to, to, to shrink to zero. Right. And then here you have something similar like that. These alpha i's have to be minus the gradients of these loss functions phi i. And then if you, if you have that for every i, then, then everything shrinks to zero. And then we're good. So, staring at this green thing, can you come up with, with, with an algorithm? Just, just, just looking at this green thing, you should get an idea for an algorithm. Primal dual of D? Yes. How would you do that? Of D alpha, then? Yes. Yes. You just discovered an algorithm here, right? So what do you do? You start with some W, right? Any W. You start with some alphas here. And from those alphas, you, you get this alpha bar. You plug them into the right-hand side. 
and you just evaluate this thing, and you get this left-hand side. And then you get new alphas and new w, and you just keep iterating these equations. So you think of this as a fixed-point iteration okay, for this nonlinear operator. Fine, that is excellent idea, except I also had the idea, except it doesn't work. Okay? So if, if you do that, this thing will diverge. So now it seems like, okay, something's wrong. On top of that, even if it converged, but, we're, but something very close to that will actually work, okay? Uh, if, in fact, it converged, then it would also suck. Why would it suck? Because you would need to evaluate this thing for all i's, right? And if you do that for all i's, it means you touch all the data points. So why would you, you don't want something like this, right? You don't want to touch all the data points in each iteration. That's too much. So what we're going to do, we will not be as greedy as to evaluate these things. We will want to keep a little bit of memory of what we had before in the previous iteration. Right? So something like this. If we have this w, we'll not move to this new w right away. We'll keep a portion of the previous w. We'll take a convex combination between the previous w and this greedy w. Okay? Does it make sense? Something in between. The same thing with the alphas. You'll keep portion of the previous alphas and, and, and then portion of those alphas. But we will do this thing only for a subset of these i's, exactly as in NSYNC. For a random subset, and any random subset goes. Okay? In particular, you can update everything if you wish, but that's not a sweet point, spot. Okay? Does it make sense? So that's what we're going to do, and that's the quartz algorithm. And again, there's a funny story, and I'll not tell you anything about, about this. It's a true story. You can read in the foot line of, of this paper how we came up with the, with the algorithm. And it's true, I promise. So here's the idea. This, this red thing is the greedy update. Okay? And I'm taking convex combination between the previous thing and the, and the red thing. Something in between. And here for the dual thing, I choose a random set exactly as an NSYNC. And it can be a random set from all these exponentially many subsets with any probabilities that you wish. You designed this. You're the designer. And for those which I selected in that set, I take again convex combination of the greedy thing, which is the red stuff, okay, if I was evaluating the operator, and what I had before. Okay? But now the convex combination is weighted with these probabilities pi. All right, so, so I'll pause now here. Uh, if, if you have any questions about this algorithm, yes? So from where are you get OK, right. That's an excellent question. So in, in, I said you, t you take a con convex combination. And I didn't exactly tell you what theta is. I mean, here is a formula for theta. But let's for a moment think, what would happen if theta was 1? If theta was 1, then you do the greedy thing, because this is not there, right? You do this thing, and this is not there. So if theta was 1, you do exactly the fixed point iteration, which I told you wouldn't work. Okay? Of course, we only know it wouldn't work, because we tried to do the analysis and run this, and we know it wouldn't work. right? You have to run it and see. And then you try to decrease the theta, and it still doesn't work from 1. And you keep decreasing, 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 it still doesn't, doesn't work. And then it hits one sweet spot, and then it works. OK? And if you keep decreasing from there, it always works, but it gets worse. OK? So you have to hit exactly that spot where it exactly works, and then anything lower than that, it wouldn't work. And this is the, this is the theta. This is precisely the theta above which it wouldn't work, in theory. In practice, you can go a little bit further, uh, and below which it would work. And notice that this theta depends on things that you know. So you can run this algorithm. It depends on the PIs, which you design. It depends on the VIs for which you have these formulas, which I told you, you know, they are formulas for the VIs. Lambda is the regular, regularizer gamma you know. So for logistic uh, laws, it would be like 1 over 4 or something like this. And n, you know how many data points you have in your data set. So you know everything there. Okay. So anything more? What is the meaning of the dual uh, uh, variable alpha? Like, right. W is the model weight that we want to learn? Yes, that's, that's, that's another amazingly good question. And the, so, so how many of you know that stochastic gradient descent doesn't have this variance reduction property? OK, so let me, let me then explain this. So if you run stochastic gradient descent, it's, it's an algorithm which runs directly on the primal problem, where you have this a finite average, this huge average. How does it do? How does it work? You pick a random example, which means random i, just, just as here. 
you take the gradient of that loss function, which is just something like this, right? just, just something like that, this red thing, and you move in the stochastic gradient direction. Okay? If you keep doing that, the algorithm will be slow. Why is that? It's because if you, if you start at the optimum, you start the algorithm from the optimum, there's no reason for the stochastic gradient to be zero. There's no reason. In fact, at optimum, the average of all the stochastic gradients is zero, because that means that the gradient of the function is zero, which means you, you have minimized the function. Because if gradient is zero, then if you have a convex function, then you have optimum. But each individual stochastic gradient can be widely non-zero, which means it will drive you away from the optimum. So it's a very noisy thing. So that's why there's this huge amount of research recently, over the last three years, on, on something called variance reduction. You would want not to have this. If you start the algorithm from the optimum, you would want it to stay there. Right? Or if you start far away from optimum, you want to get to the optimum faster. And, and if you implement the variance reduction, it will do that. Now, these alphas have precisely that meaning. These alphas are precisely the things which you should add to the stochastic gradient so that it will have the variance reduction property. So if you compute the stochastic gradient, you should not move in the stochastic gradient direction. You should change it by the alphas. Okay? And then that's the right direction in which you should move. And why is that the case? Because the stochastic gradients plus the alphas will in fact converge to zero. In, in other words, optimal alphas will be minus the optimal stochastic gradients at optimum. Okay? There is a property of this primal dual setup. That is just going to happen. So, so they have this the variance reduction property. Okay? Are we good to go? When you said about smoothness of P, right. you said that it's not smooth. So I assume that these phi eyes are smooth, okay? But the phi stars will then not be smooth, they'll be strongly convex. There's a duality between smoothness and strong convexity. Okay? So these phi are smooth, that's why I can take gradients, right? And, and I take gradient G star because G was strongly convex and G star is going to be smooth. So I can take gradients of the smooth thing. Right? I always just take gradients of the smooth thing. Okay? All right. Oh, there's one more. Double Y point as a parameter, but uh, where is the double Y in G star? So when we fix double Y? The double, what is double Y? <laughs> w. Okay. okay, okay, okay. W, all right. Right, so, if, so think, think of it this way. If G, G is L2 norm squared times one half, G star is the same thing. And for many different Gs, you can just, you can, there's a table of things, you can just read off the G star. Right? And, and that's what you use. Now, if you have a very complicated G, then yes, G star might be complicated to compute. And if that is the case, you don't want to use this algorithm. That's the honest answer. You would want to do something else. There's no algorithm which solves everything in idly. Right? You have to tweak things. So if G star is not evaluatable, don't do this. Okay. All right. So now. Uh, so this algorithm didn't appear there out of the blue. Uh, so there is a sequence of, 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 of algorithms for, for ERM with uh, increasing level of complexity. One of the first ones is this SDCA, Stochastic Dual Coordinate Ascent algorithm, appearing in uh, 2012 or 2011, depending on the which you look at it. And, and there, what uh, the authors analyze is this sampling strategy where you choose just one coordinate at a time uniformly. So that very special case. Now, MSDCA, so that was then uh, specialized to, uh, to, to some very specialized functions. And, and, and then uh, the authors looked at something that we call tau nice sampling, which is choose a subset of size tau uniformly at random. Okay? So that was the next step. And then you can see that it kind of evolved. At, at one point, important sampling was introduced. That is the one optimal. That's something like proportional to these VIs. And, 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 and so on and so forth. And quartz is the first algorithm which works with this arbitrary sampling 
So any subset with any probability you wish. And then you can design this the way you want. Uh, but it doesn't have uh, some other properties, such as this acceleration. I'm simplifying here. Uh, it, uh, you, you can in, in, in fact, you, you can throw in acceleration, and then it will depend on the square root of this condition number. OK, so that's that. Now, what is the complexity? For the complexity, I'm going to introduce yet another very complicated inequality, which defines the VIs. But in fact, this inequality is the same inequality as before. It is just simplified to this setting. Okay? So this is not a new inequality. It's just written in a different way, because you can write in a different way, which seems simple, simpler. I mean, you can believe me that this has less terms, so it looks a little bit simpler. It's the same inequality. So I'm not going to spend any time here. Uh, so this is just definition of the VIs. And once you have that, this is the uh, theorem, complexity result. And again, it's, it's as simple as, as the one before. So now, what you have, again, epsilon is killed inside the logarithm. And then uh, uh, the number of iterations is proportional to 1 over PIs plus VIs divided by something. Okay? And then you can ask the question, what is the right set? Which set should I select? with what probabilities, and so on and so forth. So in fact, you would be asking, you would be trying to reverse engineer this, and you would, you would be trying to choose a set which kind of minimizes this, subject to some maybe constraints on cost of each iteration. Okay? So since I've already explained something like this before, I, I don't think this needs any further explanation. It's just a little bit more complicated than that. Let's just give some special cases here. So there are some extensions of this. In fact, you can do analysis of the same algorithm without any duality and you get exactly the same result, and, and we try, try to do that as exercise in this paper. So you get exactly the same complexity, and there's no duality there. So this duality can be hidden if you wish to hide it. All right, so these special cases for quartz. First special case, again, as, 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 as for NSYNC, is the case where you choose just one dual variable at a time. And you can do this uniformly at random, or optimally, and optimally means proportional to these VIs, but these VIs just happen to be this in this case. So in this case, there's a formula for VIs. I call them LIs, because I don't know why. Okay, These are VIs. Uh, and this is the largest eigenvalue of AI transpose AI. Now, it looks like something may be complicated, but usually these AIs are not actually matrices. These are usually vectors, in which case largest eigenvalue of a vector times a vector is the largest eigenvalue of a one-by-one one matrix, so it's the matrix itself, right? So you don't have to compute any eigenvalues. So this is just L2 norm of the example. That's all. That's the VI squared. Right. So you have that, and then again, there's the same story. Uh, for uniform sampling, this thing depends on the maximum of these LIs, of this uh, L2 norm squared of the samples. And for the optimal sampling, is the average of the VIs. If the average is much better than the maximum, then this important sampling will, will be much better than the uniform sampling. So the same story goes. But now you have this extra plus n. What this extra plus n tells you is that you have to go through the data at least once. Okay, you have to somehow uh, do at least n iterations if you have n data points, okay? if, if, if this theory is, is to be applied. All right, so now you can, you can do some, some, some uh, experiments, so we use the Cov1 data set here. This is just a very uh, simple experiment where, where you can see that if you uh, do this uniformly, you get a blue line. And if you do this optimally, you get a red line and you get some speed up. And uh, the speed up in this case is not much. It's like twice, OK? So you might say, I, I don't want to bother with this. In some cases, you get a lot of speed up. In some cases, you get no speed up, OK? Uh, it really depends on whether the average is uh, much better than the maximum. Okay, that's what it depends on. And I could have come up with examples which are synthetic, where I play with the average and the maximum, make them arbitrarily small, far away or close to each other, and then you see this gap grows or or it shrinks. Right now, I promise in the talk title that this has something to do also with sparsity. So there's something interesting going on here. If I want to use a mini batch of examples. Why would I want to use mini-batch? One reason for this is the following. If I have data which is sparse, and here, let's say that omega prime is some sort of a measure of sparsity of the data set. I don't want to write down the exact uh, um, definition here, because it's a com complicated formula, but it precisely what it means 
it's a normalized measure of average sparsity, which is always between 1 and n. Okay? So you define it that way. And it's the sparsity of the data itself, of the AIs, of those examples. Okay? And uh, if it's 1, then you have fully sparse data. And if it's n, then you have fully dense data. Okay? And what you would want to see, how does the sparsity of the data affect mini-batching performance? And in fact, you can say something theoretically about this. And this is what you can say. If you have fully sparse data, which is the idle scenario you never have, so I'm only introducing it here, not because I want to say this is how the algorithm is going to work, but just to understand what is the best possible thing you can possibly achieve in the best uh, idle world. Then notice what happens. You get the previous complexity that you had for, for uh, choosing tau is equal to 1, which means one coordinate at a time, or one example at a time, uniformly at random, and you just divide it by tau. Okay. In other words, if I updated one dual variable at a time, which means I look at one example at a time, uniformly at random, then tau is 1 there. If I do 2, I divide by 2. If I do 3, I divide by 3. What, what does it mean? I get perfect linear speed up. Okay? So if I choose mini badge of size 100, it's going to be 100 times faster. That's precisely what's going to happen if you have fully sparse data. Okay? The theory predicts that. Predicts that. Okay? Now, on the other hand, if you have fully dense data, which you rarely do have, but it may happen, then the first thing is divided by tau, and the second thing is untouched. It doesn't change. So mini-batching is going to kill this term eventually, but it will not do anything with this one. If this is the dominating term, mini-batching will not help you. Okay? So that's what's going on. Now, usually you're somewhere in between, and if, in fact, you're in between with this omega tilde uh, average sparsity, then this is the, this is the uh, expression there. It looks complicated, but it's something in between. So this, this goes down linearly, and this goes down also linearly, but with the kind of s s weaker slope. Okay? Right. So I'll pause here. Yeah. Can you give an example of this sparse data and this dense data? So you have these examples, AIs, these are matrices. Think of them as being actually vectors. Usually these are just vectors. If these vectors are sparse, so these are uh, d dimensional vectors, if most of these things are zero, then this omega tilde would be closer to one than to n. That's what I mean by that. Right? Fully sparse would actually mean that you have just one non-zero in each AI, which means it's, you never get that, right? In fact, the story is not as bleak as you might think in the case of fully dense data, because this is one way you can look at it. But in fact, even for fully dense data, things can go good if, if you do the analysis in a little bit different way, and we do it in the paper, and then things don't depend on sparsity, but on some spectral properties of the data. So you can still have dense data, which has good spectral properties, and then you still can get something like linear speed up. But it's something you cannot really see. How do you compute spectral properties of some data set? I mean, you would never want to do that. Sparsity is something that you kind of know from the application itself. You know, oh, I get sparse data, so probably mini-batching would work. If you don't have sparse data, mini-batching might still work, because there might be hidden sparsity, uh, spectral version of sparsity. Okay. Right. Yes? Could you give an example when uh, AI is not attracted by metrics? Right. So, uh, so if you if you uh, have uh, more labels than just one, then we model this so that AIs would be matrices. Okay. So multi-class classification. And you're still in the assumption of linear model. Yes. 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 So if you have nonlinear models, then you have to do things differently. For instance, one thing that that, that changes is that uh, you may not have any duality. For instance. Once you throw in non-convexity, let's say, then you would want to do something like this, but without the duality. Okay? Uh, and it's possible to do something like this in the duality. It's possible to still come up with these alpha i's so that you perturb these stochastic gradients. Right? So you can get motivation from this and intuition, but you will not be able to do exactly this. Right. So now I have some slides which I will just probably just jump through. These are not very useful slides. So for instance, this slide says that if uh, 
the level of sparsity is something like, oh, lambda, gamma, n. I was promising you I would not really, I wasn't a fan of this O notation. But if this was the case, then in fact you get linear speed up, guaranteed linear speed up, right? So for, for sparse data of this order, you always get linear speed up, okay? All right. So now I have some curves. These are theoretical curves, which tell you something about how much speed up you can expect. So if you have, let's say, a million data points, okay? Just an example. And all of this is theory. Uh, and the average level of sparsity is 10 to the power of 2. So it's, some, it's always, remember, it's something between 1 and million, right? So this is pretty sparse data. Uh, and gamma is 1, which, which is, you know, that's fine. Almost every uh, loss function is gamma, like 1 or 1 quarter or something like this. <laughs> then this is what happens. So what does this mean? As I increase tau, which is my mini batch size, from 1 to 500,000, 2,000, and so on, then the speed up factor just grows exactly with it almost linearly. Speed up factor is how much faster is the algorithm uh, with the town eye sampling as opposed to one eye sampling. How much speed up do you expect? And this, these are theoretical curves. So if the regularizer is very small, that's the blue line, 10 to the power minus 6, which is something like 1 over n, 1 over the data set size, right? Which, which is usually a standard thing, then yes, you slightly depart from, uh, from linear speed up. But, you know, not by much. Now, if you push this, you can, you can go this uh, here. Uh, so that means that if now the data is, is much more dense, then the speed up can be really, really tiny. Okay? Even with, you know, you start increasing the mini-batch size, it helps a little bit and then nothing. And you will see this in practice. So this is not just a theoretical thing. So, so I can come up with, with problems, I, I, will, I, will, I will give them to you, and, and you will run, and, and you do some mini-batch sizes, start increasing mini-batches, and nothing happens. You, you get very little extra for, for, the, for, the, for the increase in the mini-batch size. And this is the reason. So mini-batching uh, is sensitive to some properties of the data, such as sparsity or spectral properties of the data, and so on. And it's good to know what kind of data we're working with so that we know whether mini-batching is useful or not. Of course, you can just, just try to run this, and, and then you see. But sometimes it's good to know also theoretically what's going on. And you, you can go to extreme, and you, you can just kill this at all, and then mid-batching doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and so on, if you wished. And, and then you can do this. Uh, uh, in fact, these are very nice curves, because I, I have two curves here, the blue curve, and there's another curve right there. I'm comparing now theory and practice. So I constructed a data set. In fact, did I? No, I didn't. This is the astrophysics data set. It's a real data set where I compare theory against practice. And you can see that theory just predicts exactly what's going on. So for some reason, we're very lucky, even though uh, we're really taking a ratio of two upper bounds, and that's what we're drawing here. Uh, and, uh, but, but you can see that there's, there's tight match. And there is, there is a line underneath this line and line going through there. And here, this is a perfect match. So this is, in fact, what's going on. All right, so there's a theoretical slide here, which how many of you are interested in a theoretical slide? Nobody. So that's what I thought, which means I'm just going here, I'm going here, okay? So you just voted me out of this. Excellent. Uh, all right. How much more time do I have? I didn't check my time. Uh, 20 minutes. Okay. I'm not sure what the end time it looks like about 20 minutes. Okay. So. So let me pause here, and I have a few more slides here on some distributed uh, methods. Uh, if, if you have anything that you want to comment on. Uh, what if we compare words with SAC and the CRG? What can we, can we say? Yes, so, so these are similar methods. So SAC, for instance, was analyzed uh, uh, for choosing mini batch size of one, uniform at random. So that is the analysis. So you can compare them in that regime, and the theory is very similar. You get, you get slightly better results here because, uh, because uh, for instance, the standard analysis of SAG uh, doesn't utilize uh, the uh, curvature hidden in the data, so the VIs. On the other hand, it can accelerate if you have hidden strong convexity, and this thing cannot. So, so the very quick rule of thumb, we have these comparisons in, in papers. I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have slides on this. So the very basic rule of thumb would be SVRG, SAG, and the squirts, they behave the same. Okay? So, so one way to think about this is that 
uh, this uh, quartz is, is, is a general way of looking at things where you can do any mini-batching you wish. That's one way to think about it. Okay. But now you can extend these things, but you can extend the SAG. You can do SAGA, you can do SVRG with mini-batching. In fact, we wrote a paper about SVRG with mini-batching. And, and you get just the same results as here. So somehow all these things converge. Once you start doing this, this, this thing right, different approaches converge to the same results. And there are different algorithms. They have their advantages and disadvantages. But the square G may be applied for non-convexity. Yes, so, for that's, so once you have non-convexity, then you wouldn't want to do duality. That's, that's a definite answer, yes. So in order to go through these, there's a list of, of many different small advantages, disadvantages. They can be large in some settings and smaller in others. But if you have the same domain, if you assume the same things and it's the same problem, then they behave about the same. Okay. Here you can do a little bit better because of these, of these, uh, of these larger step sizes. All right. And uh, you get uh, another uh, advantage of this approach, but in fact you can apply these things and do SVRG type of algorithms with these ideas of arbitrary sampling. So I'm lying a little bit here. But the idea behind this arbitrary sampling and understanding algorithms from this point of view is that then you can design distributed methods if you wish. You can design uh, mini batch methods, serial methods, all kinds of methods. In fact, here is uh, uh, a distributed quartz implementation. Uh, so the basic idea could be the following. So you start with the quartz algorithm. This is the quartz algorithm. And you say, I want to run this in a distributed way. So what is the cheapest possible way of doing this? Right? Something like, I have one day to do that. I have to do it. I'm releasing something tomorrow. How do I do this in a distributed way? So that means that you have a huge data set. You are not storing on a single computer, so you have to store it in a distributed way on a number of nodes. So what do you do? Well, you first partition all the data into some, into some sets, right? You store it, well, you probably already stored the data that way, right? So the data is stored in a partitioned way across a number of nodes. Now, how do you run this algorithm? Well, the data is correspond to the dual variable. So when you, pick, when, when, when you pick a mini batch of certain size, then it may just lie on one node just by chance, right? If I choose a mini batch size of size 100, maybe I choose a mini batch which, size, which lives on this node, and all these nodes will do nothing in that iteration, right? So you want to avoid something like this. If you want to avoid something like that, I'll, I'll get back to this slide. So this is what you do. You take all the data sets. You have examples in, in, in the columns. You partition the A and the dual variables. And if you want to do the same thing for SVRG, you do the same thing with SVRG. You partition the examples. And instead of dual variables, uh, you, you, you'll have these uh, variance reduction parameters. So you do this. You store these on the C computers. And then you select a subset of these examples in each iteration, but on each node. Okay? So it's a very, very particular thing that you want to do. Why would you want to do that? Because you don't want any of these nodes to be idle. You want each node to work, obviously. So I choose, let's say, subsets of, si of size 3, just for an example. So it has to be chunky enough. And I do that on every node. So this way, I have defined a random subset, but the random subset is structured, and the structure comes from the fact that I'm running a distributed algorithm. Right? Because it is uh, a union of random sets coming from a partition of the data. So it's a very particular random set. Okay? Once I have the random set, I have to come up with these VI's parameters in order to run this. But there is this paper which tells you what these VI's are, and there are formulas. Okay? So you just use them. Uh, and in fact, uh, we do that. We use the formula for the VI's, and you get this complicated, horrible expression. Okay? You don't even look at it. Okay? But the point is, it tells you exactly what you want. So, so you, you have C times tau, C times tau. You get a speed up, which is proportional to the number of nodes you have, times how much work you do on each node. And there is something you know, ridiculous there. But in fact, uh, you, you, can, you can get some very interesting uh, insights from that, such as, so if you inspect this, and you spend a couple days on that, which we did, then you realize that it doesn't matter how you distribute the data to these nodes as long as the, as, as, as the data is balanced, somehow the complexity is always at most a factor of two from the optimal way of distributing the data. That's a theorem. So which means as long as the data is balanced, you don't have to worry. This algorithm is robust under that. So you, you can, you, from this complicated thing, you, you can derive certain uh, theorems and insights, but I don't want to go there. 
the point I'm making here is that I used the algorithm and the setup that I had before, and I just applied it to a distributed setup setting just by constructing a set which is a which is union of these random sets. I use these VIs, which are pre-computed in this paper. I apply this, and it runs. And we run something like this. Uh, this was already a couple years ago, three years ago, but it, it just appeared uh, this year in this Hydra algorithm. So this was a data set. It was a three terabyte data set. It was a lasso problem that we're solving with uh, uh, a billion examples. So we run this uh, on, a, on a Hector supercomputer that we have in Edinburgh which is the largest supercomputer in the UK. And we run the theoretical algorithm. There's the blue line. And in about a quarter of an hour, you can see that we solve this to death. Right? That's, we call this to death. That's the official term. You know, 20. It's something that you would never want to do in practice. Okay? So we only do it. I'm showing off here. This is not useful. Okay? But you want, if you want to know that the algorithm actually works, then you run it and you see, okay, it does work. Fine. So we cannot explain why it's going like this and then it... Uh, speeds up, there's probably some local acceleration going on, fine, but it does. And then we uh, introduce some asynchronous communication protocol and we can, we can half uh, the computation time by, by being a little bit smarter. Probably one can do even better than that. So these ideas uh, really do work. And then you can also apply it to larger problem. Here you have actually 50 billion uh, variables. So, 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 it's, so it's bigger than that. And now we use an accelerated variant of this, which I didn't describe here, but you, uh, I told you, you can accelerate it. Many of these tricks are orthogonal. You can just combine them in any way you wish. And when you do that, then you can see that the red line accelerates on the blue line. Now, please don't look at the y-axis, because if you do, you discover a uh, secret, right? And the secret is we didn't really solve the problem, right? This is 10 to the power minus 0 0.1. The reason is, uh, we don't really want to pay too much for the supercomputer, and we, we're not really interested in solving this problem. It was an artificial problem. We're just interested in showing that acceleration accelerates. Okay, so we're solving an optimization problem, right? Publish a paper subject to not paying much for the supercomputer, okay? And that's what we solve, okay? <laughs> right. Uh, and then you can, you can, you can w once you have this understanding, you can come up with all kinds of other further improvements. So this is not the state of the art anymore. It, 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 it was at some point in time. But if you utilize curvature information uh, on top of this, but you don't have to throw this out, you can do it on top of that, then you get further improvements. So we did this in this algorithm SDNA, Stochastic Dual Newton Ascent. So there is a way of introducing curvature into this. Or you can do something with, if, if you like, a non-convexity, as everybody likes these days, you can have a primal-only version. So with this aid algorithm, which also goes a long way in improving practical, not theoretical rate, but practical rate is, is largely improved because of the use of, of, of curvature information on these nodes. So, for instance, we came up with this algorithm uh, COCO plus, adding versus averaging in distributed uh, parameter optimization, where we're thinking of doing the following thing. Everybody knows how to minimize their function on a single node. All companies know this. They, they have their code, and uh, they have... Uh, um, groups of engineers that fine-tune this, they love their code, right? And then suddenly it comes a problem, I, my problem, which before was solvable on a single node, I have to go distribute it. How do you do that? You have to throw everything out because uh, a natural extension to distributed setup just stops working. And that's exactly the selling point of this, of this algorithm here, because what we said is that we can provide for any local solver that you have a communication protocol on top of that so that we solve the big problem in a distributed way, and you can still run the local solvers on these local nodes. And we did the analysis in that way, and the algorithm uh, also runs very well. So at, this, at, at that point when we wrote this, uh, this was the state of the art as far as, as we could tell, but then, then this improved things even further and so on, but I do not really have time to talk about these other things. I'll be happy to talk about them offline. So thank you very much. Yes. I have a question about uh, using second order information. Yes. Uh, can we say that this stochastic dual Newton ascent is better <coughs> than usual uh, first order method? Yes. Only as a local convergence? No. Method? In fact, in fact, in fact, global. That's a very nice property of this. It's global. So what's going on is that. Uh, 
I can even explain it on this duality here. So the dual thing was something like something like quadratic plus this uh, separable, strongly convex but non-smooth regularizer. Forget about that second part. For okay, forget about it. So let's say that the dual problem is just quadratic maximization problem, concave quadratic maximization problem. What uh, coordinate descent does, or this arbitrary sampling does, it, it does something like the following. You look into a random subspace of certain dimension, and the dimension is dictated by the size of st. And in that subspace, you take a gradient step. If you inspect all of this that's going on here, that is being done then there in a hidden way. Even the randomized fixed point thing does something like that. Now, there's this obvious idea that once you look into this random subspace of size, size of ST, okay, mini batch size, you can do something better than just gradient step, right? You can actually solve the problem there or take a Newton step or something like this. That's what we do. That's what SDNA kind of is, right? And, okay, and now to your question, then what you can show that the speed up in mini batch size is at least linear, always independent of the sparsity or spectral properties of the data. And that's magical property of the second order information you have there. So everything I was saying about how this algorithm sucks if you have data which is dense or if the spectral properties are not good, none of that is true once you throw in the second order information and you do SDNA. Because then you get at least linear speed up always, no matter what the data looks like. And that is a global, pro global property. But in the limit, when we come to the usual Newton method, when we, yes. use, when we sample all yes. the components, yes. for the usual Newton method, we know that it is not better than a gradient descent from the global point. Yes, so this will still have linear rate. It will not have quadratic rate. It will have global linear rate. Okay. What and, yeah, that's exactly the point. So it will have still linear rate. It will not have a quadratic rate, so it will not go as far as that. But it's global. But the constant has the property that it, it depends, it improves at least linearly in mini-batch size. So you always have divided by tau or better, always, independent of whether, what the sparsity looks like. That's what it does. That's what it does. And that's what you want in some sense, right? The lock thing doesn't matter, really. So you, you don't want to solve the problem anyway, right? You just overfit, so. <laughs> so do we have enough questions, or do you guys have any more? I'll hang around after this. Happy to talk further. Yes? So the second order information that we use is that thing of G as being L2 norm squared. If you remember that slide on the duality, which is this complicated star, there was this G star, which is also L2 norm squared, so there was a quadratic function there, plus this regularizer. So in fact, what we do, we, the second order information in the dual never changes. That's the main insight, because it's hidden in a quadratic. The quadratic has a Hessian, which never changes, right? The, s the regularizer, you know, th there's something going on with it, but it's separable. It's separable, so that is a beautiful property. So, in fact, what we do, we do something like inversion of a random submatrix of that fixed Hessian. And there's the second order information that we use. So we really utilize the fact that the second order information never changes, so we can, in the dual, and we can trace it easily. Yes. No, it's not. So you have this upper bound, and the formulas that we have are the best possible formulas we can come up with, but we don't claim these are the best possible VIs. These are, in, in some sense, where we're, we're doing an optimization, bi-level optimization. Okay, we're not doing that explicitly. So on the one hand, we want to have a closed form formula and easily computable, something that you just look at the data and know what it is. And at the same time, the VI to be small. So in fact, you can depart from this, and, and in any practical situation, you would try to learn these VIs on the way and improve and so on. But it's good to start from the theoretical understanding of what, the, what good VIs are as a starting point, and then you can go and explore further. They're not optimal. They're the best we can prove. Are we good? Yes. All right, thank you very much.